his life. Tell me when. It's, it's live now. Oh. Well, you caught me mid-sip, but that's okay. I'll finish this sip, and then we'll let her rip. Happy Wet Wednesday. I've found, thanks to Connor, a particularly wonderful book that uh, uses as its inspiration the uh, Book of Kells. And again, remember how I've gone on about how certain covers feel a certain way when you touch them. This is one of those books that is a complete delight to hold in your hand. And I'll show you the cover. It's called The Book of Kells. Now notice something. The B in book, can you see that there's a critter above and there are all sorts of designs? And look at the K in Kells, again, critters within. The Book of Kells is the most astounding uh, visual literary artifact. And it is this uh, particular book is by Barbara Crooker. And I'm just going to read you a few selections from this. Uh, it's something that I encourage you strongly to pick up and, and look at. You don't re really need to know about the Book of Kells too much, but I will tell you, if you go back and research it a little bit, there are even illuminate copies of the illuminated uh, manuscript. Quite spectacular and colorful. Introduction. The Book of Kells is an illuminated manuscript gospel book in Latin containing the four gospels of the New Testament together with the various uh, uh, prefactory text and tables. It was created in a uh, Columban monastery in either Britain or Ireland. It is believed to have been created circa 1800 AD and it is a masterwork of Western calligraphy and represents the pinnacle of insular illumination. It is also widely regarded as Ireland's finest national treasure. The illustrations and ornamentation of the Book of Kells surpass that of other insular gospel books in extravagance and complexity. The decoration combines traditional Christian iconography with the ornate swirling motifs typical of insular art. Figures of humans, animals, and mythical beasts, together with Celtic knots and interlacing patterns in vibrant colors, enliven the manuscript's pages. Many of these minor decorative elements are imbued with Christian symbolism and so further emphasize the themes of the major illustrations. The plates are numbered with an R or a V to indicate recto right, verso left. Barbara Crooker received a writing fellowship at the Tyrone Guthrie Center uh, County, uh, uh, Monaghan, Ireland, where she uh, meditated on pages from the Book of Kells, both in the Long Library, Trinity College, Dublin, and online. And it dawns on me with my eye to my ear that I might have given you a soft C in Celtic, which is the proper pronunciation. And now, Subhain. Night opens its woven basket, spills spools of thread on the worn rug of the sky, places a silver thimble to light the way. The old woman says, sweep the hearth, light the fire, winter is coming. Look in the mirror swirled with smoke. Turn over a card, sprinkle salt in the doorway. A single candle flickers 
drowns in its own wax. Schlig, Michiel, Aglorosa. This is from Kenneth Clark, a com comment. It is hard to believe that for quite a long time, almost a hundred years, Western Christianity survived by clinging to places like Skillig Michael, a pinnacle of rock 18 miles from the Irish coast, rising 700 feet out of the sea. Pablo Muruda, uh, translated by Alistair Reed in Praise of Ironing, writes, Every day, hands are creating the world. Fire is married to steel and canvas. Linen and cotton come back from the skirmishes of the laundries. And now, Barbara says, they sat on hard benches in stone beehives perched above the immaculate sea on the steepest, most wind-battered peak climbing 600 steps to the scriptoria on rocks piled by the hand of God. Skillig Michael, high above the waters curl, the Vikings somehow found them, looted, plundered, but the monks built again, and the word unfurled. Every day, hands are creating the world. On this impossible crag, this tower of slate stone, dark fissures, castellated outcrops terrifying above the brooding sea. The steps rise between fangs of rock, a space to chasten or elevate souls. Feel how it was to live in a coke chan, nothing but obdurate rock above and below. In Europe, Books burn, but here we're concealed. Fire is married to steel. No one could labor like this who didn't love books. The gospel page shining white as cotton, fresh from the laundry, a pledge that darkness could turn into light. Even the shapes of letters were magical. The humps and curves of half insular, insular, majuscule, black ink made from soot inscribed on sheepskin, the fabric of God's words, newly woven. Hands fast as shuttles, each simple act canvas, linen, and cotton come back. Imagine a world without reading or learning. Imagine a life without books. A land ruled by axe and sword, stones stained with blood, no bleach or bluing to set things right, no iron mangle to wring things clean. Cities tumble to rubble, books burn for warmth, armies looting the countryside. Only the Irish on an island in the icy sea, water swirled and rock haunted the ragged edge of the West, saved whole libraries from the skirmishings of the foundries. And a few more brief bits. Angels. 
Do you believe in them? Hmm. Well, one set of scholars believes the Book of Kells was created to honor the 200th anniversary of the death of Colum Keel, Saint Columba. In the Book of Kells, messengers are both seen and unseen, framing the Virgin at the Nativity in all four corners. The infant Christ, dressed as a small man, fully clothed on his mother's knee. The angel in the upper left seems to be saying, oh my God, what have you done? Do you really think this was a good idea? The one on the upper right uh, seems resigned. You want to send him where? While the two at the bottom, crowded behind Mary's chair, seem dwarfed by the occasion, relegated to the corners, but they're always there. I like the angels on the arm of the Kai in the great Kai row. You have to tilt the page to see them, unflagrant, hovering above. And some angels are almost hidden, like, like the one in folio 48R, hands outstretched in prayer, framed in the diamond-shaped O of Omnia. What would it have been like to live then in the time of, of Colum Kyle, when angels might have been hovering in the believable air and another interlinear. <laughs> Let's praise the agile little animals that flit here and there in the Vulgate text, who can wedge in small spaces. The moth in initial P antenna flicking, flickering outside the line, or the monk on his horse trotting right off the page. Oh, look, there's an otter, his mouth full of fish. And here, a blue cat sits watchfully by. A gorgeous green lizard slithers in the text, 72R, while a wolf pads his way through 76V. It's a whole barnyard. Chickens and mice, hounds and hares, snakes, eagles and stags. Animals as decoration. Animals as punctuation. Things seen and unseen. So let us praise all of God's creatures. Oh, including the small and the inconsequential. All of us, interlinear, part of the larger design. And finally, snake, symbol of the resurrection, slithering and hissing down the page. The monks believed a snake was restored to youth whenever it shed its skin. But then there was the snake in Genesis. Huh? The loss of innocence, the great fall, a double-edged sword, a forked tongue. In the Book of Kells, some snakes are made out of abstract interlace, while others form complete borders, 
serpentine coiling, interweaving fretwork tracery S. Remember the cover? Remember the animals within the letters? Here they are alluded to. Here they are immortalized verbally as well as visually. And now I hope I've inspired you to turn the pages of this book once more to find the other treasures that are inside. And I'm going to continue with my all time favorite in the whole wide world The Poetry Remedy. You're going to be hearing from uh, William Siegert um, throughout the next month or so, because I just, I wanna read the whole thing and I can't out loud to you, but certain sections we'll spend a little bit of time with. And now, Lack of courage. Is this what you suffer from? It's also suitable for fear. Lack of confidence. Lack of conviction. Taking a risk can be a terrifying thing. And I say that as someone who has started more ventures than I can count. Every one of us has known the peculiar vulnerability of putting not only our physical assets and safety, but also our own ego on the line when taking a, a, a leap of faith. What is remarkable is how much harder it is to take that step than it is to pick ourselves up again if it fails. We only had the courage of our convictions and we're willing to fail every now and again, we would achieve so much more. Many patients in my poetry pharmacy tell me that they feel they lack the requisite courage to make the leap in life that they've always dreamed of, whether it might be to write, paint, end a relationship, a start a relationship, or simply confront something that's frightened them. People can spend entire lifetimes putting off the risks that might make them the happiest. Oh, I can't tell you the number of people I've met who've spent 30 years, sometimes even longer, dreaming of changing their lives and never daring. It leads to a sort of paralysis of the soul, which undercuts all of life's pleasures and stops you from evolving. When fear keeps you from pursuing your goals, it's, it's like you've stopped writing the story of your existence halfway through. No one wants to look back upon their life as a potential masterpiece that never quite made it. I often prescribe this poem to people who have lost their confidence and, like the cowardly lion in the Wizard of Oz, are in need of encouragement. It shows how a, a leap into the unknown, whether it's a bungee jump or a marriage proposal can lead to joy, not disaster. And the poem prescribed, which he's referring to, to the edge, or we might fall, Come to the edge, uh, it's too high. 
come to the edge, um, and, and they came, and he pushed, and they flew. And another one. defeatism, apathy, discouragement, pessimism, lack of self-belief, low esteem. <laughs> In my own life, I'm very familiar with the difference uh, self-belief can make to performance. When I'm feeling a bit flat and useless, I can see the difference spelled out in the way I engage with the world and those around me. I cannot inspire excitement and confidence in others because I have lost them in myself. Perhaps I should have Walter D. Wintle's poem, Thinking, taped to the inside of my jacket as a crib sheet. So many people come to my pharmacy and say, mm, I think I'm beaten. I'm destroyed. This is always heartbreaking to hear, but I think they have enough emotional and physical strength to turn it around. Then I don't treat them gently. Instead, I give them this poem as a sort of kick in the pants. If you walk in and say, I'm going to lose. Before you've even tried, you haven't got a chance. Now, sometimes the only uh, way is to talk yourself into it, whatever it might be. Although it is useful for all ages, I find myself prescribing this poem particularly frequently to young people and teenagers, people who are just getting started in life and who may have taken a few knocks on the way, but who really only need a supportive sense of self-belief to get going. As your parents probably told you, whatever you want to do, you can achieve it with hard work and self-belief. Or at least, without those things, you'll never achieve anything worth having. And here is the poem. Thinking by Walter D. Wintle. If you think you are beaten, huh, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win, but think you can't, it's almost a cinch, you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out of the world we find success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or fastest man, but soon or late, the man who wins is the one who thinks he can. Now that gives me hope. Need for mindfulness. No, we're not having a yoga retreat. 
It's suitable for disconnectedness, need for gratitude. Prayer to many in our secular age has become a dirty word. The concept is dismissed as fusty or naive, the practice even more so. And yet, as the popularity of meditation and mindfulness soar, there seems to be a collective longing for a moment of quiet in our busy lives, a moment in which another voice, an internal whisper, all too easily drowned out between the sirens and chatter of modern life, may speak. Mark Oakley, a canon at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, wrote a wonderful book about how to him liturgy was poetry. Oh, no matter the religion, he says, the devotional words we chant or memorize or sing are a kind of poetry that links us to the divine. In the case of many religions, those words can be in a language that the worshipers themselves don't even understand. And yet somehow the cadence of those words is enough to transport us. It's not only the religious who can gain from prayer, just as it's not only the religious who can appreciate a spectacular cathedral or mosque or temple. Prayer is a constant that runs through all human civilizations. And it is there for a reason. Mary Oliver reminds us that we are all in need of a doorway into thanks, a way of, of relating to the world without our egos. And for just a moment, allowing ourselves to feel quiet gratitude for all the small moments of grace that we encounter daily. To thank the world around us for containing blue irises and weeds and small stones. Stop in the street, in the garden, on the train. Pay attention. Put together a few simple words that <laughs> feel right. If you're very quiet and very lucky, you might just hear a voice whispering back to you. Praying by Mary Oliver. We've read a number of her poems together. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a, a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Trust the moment, I say. Oh, and now here's one of my all time favorites. You notice how many favorites I have? Well, it's true. I'm not overstating. I really do love poetry. Um, here's an important one. 
failure to live in the moment. You know, before I got here, I was worried about getting on time for a doctor's appointment for a friend, and I was worried about this, and I was worried about that, and then I've got a production meeting tonight, and then I've got a rehearsal tonight, and I was just rambling on and on and on about all the stuff I had to do. It was doing me, and I wasn't paying any attention. Well, let's see what our guide, our prescriber has to say about that. We've all been told to live in the moment before. It's become something of a catchphrase of self-help culture. But just as with so many other seemingly simple pieces of advice, it can be very hard to know what living in the moment actually means. And what it might look like. Buddhists sometimes talk about the second arrow, the, the suffering we inflict on ourselves by worrying about future pain or by regretting past mistakes. Sometimes the things we dread surprise us by being far less awful than we feared. Sometimes, our agony over a past deed is out of all proportion to the act itself. In such cases, it may be our thoughts and not the reason for them that do the most damage. The second arrow is deadlier than the first. Evidently, we need to learn to avoid shooting that second arrow at all. This Mark Dotty tells us, is where the golden retrievers come in. Bull, squirrel, pond. These are the ways that dogs navigate the world. Their day-to-day -day experience is exactly that. Experience. If we could let the average, well-looked-after dog teach us how to live as it does, to bounce from excitement to excitement without ever pausing for analysis. Perhaps we could be as joyful as it is. Tomorrow, if that's what you call it, can wait until tomorrow. Granted, living like a dog full-time may not exactly be convenient, but for a few moments, for the length of a walk, surely we can respond to the rallying call, the zen bow wow of the golden retriever. For that long, at least. Anyone who knows me knows that my favorite breed is Golden Retriever. I have been possessed by two in the course of my years. And now, notice the play with the word, not retrievers. I'll be careful with my pronunciation. Mark Dotty writes, Golden retrievals. Fetch. <laughs> Balls and sticks capture my attention seconds at a time. Catch. Uh, I don't think so. <gasps> Bunny tumbling leaf. A squirrel who's, oh, joy, actually scared. Sniff the wind, then I'm off again. Muck, punt, ditch, residue of any thrillingly dead thing. And you? Huh. Either you're sunk in the past half hour walk, thinking of what you can never bring back, or else you're off in some fog concerning 
tomorrow. Is that what you call it? My work, to unsnare time's warp and woof, retrieving my haze-headed friend to you, this shining bark, a Zen master's bronzy gong calling you here entirely now. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. I think that's my philosophy of life, if I'm not mistaken. And I think we will end for today. Um, and I do have a treat in store for you on Friday. We're going to read some Yiddish folk tales. They're quite applicable to today, to yesterday. Oh, and tomorrow. Bow wow, folks. See you on Friday.